Welcome to the World History One Lecture Series. At the end of each slide, there will be a 10 second delay. Use this time to pause the presentation and complete your notes. When you are done, push play and you will move forward. This lecture will begin in five seconds. Welcome to World History One Lecture 5.6 on the Persian Wars and let's go back to ancient civilizations. Here's the Persian Empire. And what did we learn? One, Persia is huge. Two, Persia is a major ancient empire. And three, Persia is cultured. These aren't barbarians. These are people who run a sophisticated civilization. Now, let's talk about Greece. Greece is tiny. Greece is a new classical civilization and Greece is not unified. So how did this little tiny civilization beat the Persian Empire? Let's find out and go to the next slide. The cool thing about Greece is that we can see how history moves between one era and the next, and how an age can bring about a new era. And in this case, the Iron Age brings about the Classical Era. We've already talked about this. Eras and ages often do not change quickly. Instead, it takes time to move from one time period to the next. It's like the tide at the ocean. You don't just go from low tide to high tide. There's all this space in between where the ocean either moves in or moves out. Now, high tide here is the Persian Empire, which represents the height of the ancient era and the Bronze Age. But the new tide is Greek civilization, which represents the beginning of the Classical Era and the Iron Age. And the Persian Wars represent a newer type of civilization, Greek Classical, replacing an older type of civilization, Persian Ancient, due to the advancement of one age, iron, over another age bronze. The Greeks have better technology. They're using a stronger metal and in the end it's going to help them. Go to the next slide. Do you remember when I told you that Hollywood is full of historians? Well, sometimes Hollywood needs to change the story to make it better for them. And the Persian Wars are the perfect example of this happening. In Hollywood, the Persian Empire is evil. But the truth is so much cooler. The Persian Empire is the main power in 494 BCE. In other words, the Persian Empire is large and in charge, but they are also in charge of an area called Ionia, which is on the east coast of the Aegean Sea. The Ionians, they're treated poorly by the Persians, so they revolt. But the Ionians need help if they want to beat Persia. That's where Greece comes in. You see, Athens wants to control the Aegean Sea, so they help out the Ionians. In other words, the Athenians use Ionia as an excuse to take the Aegean Sea. So, unlike Hollywood's version, the Greeks start messing with the Persians, not the other way around. Go to the next slide. As you can imagine, the Persians, led by Darius I, are very upset, not just with the Athenians, but with all Greeks, because the Persians feel the Greeks interfered with Ionia, and the Persians attack the Greek mainland. The Athenians and the Spartans are going to form an alliance, or an agreement, to fight the Persian Empire. Now you have to understand something. This is the only reason that Athens and Sparta would unite. It's like the Yankees and the Red Sox joining teams to save baseball. The Athenians have a navy and marines, boat-based soldiers. The Spartans have an army. Together, 
they might just be able to defeat the Persians. Go to the next slide. Hollywood likes to focus on the Second Persian War, but there was actually a First Persian War in 490 BCE. Here's what happened. Darius I of the Persian Empire launches an attack on Greece from the Aegean Sea, the very sea that Athens was trying to control. And it doesn't take long for the Greeks to get in trouble. At the Battle of Marathon, the Greek army is outnumbered 10,000 men to 100,000 men. But the Greeks are smart. The Greeks attack the Persians when they learn that there is no Persian cavalry. There are no soldiers on horseback supporting the troops on the ground in the Persian army. That's not good. So the Greeks outmaneuver the Persians and the Persians panic, fleeing to their boats. This is the first time that the Greeks know they can beat the Persians. Go to the next slide. So let's catch up with Hollywood and look at the Second Persian War, which happens in 480 BCE. The Persians, now led by Xerxes I, who looks nothing like he does in the movies, invade Greece and plan to burn Athens to the ground. Athens is the primary target. The Spartans meet the Persian army at Thermopylae Pass and they're trying to give the Athenians enough time to evacuate the city. And the Spartans do it. They hold off the Persians using the phalanx. It's a technique where soldiers in a close formation move slowly forward. But the Spartans are eventually defeated and they all die in the Thermopylae Pass. That's the 300. Go to the next slide. Hollywood loves a good sequel, and so do we. So let's look at part two of the Second Persian War, still in 480 BCE. The Persians do burn Athens to the ground, but only after the city is evacuated. And now, the Persian army is deep in Greek territory. They're going to need to be rescued by the Persian navy. But... The Athenian navy wipes out or destroys the Persian navy at Salamis using something called a pincer technique. In other words, they trick the Persian navy into being surrounded. Here's a pincer. Insert Persian navy here and crush. And that is the end of the Second Persian War. Go to the next slide. The Greeks are an Iron Age civilization that defeat the ancient era Persians. And this is going to have a tremendous impact on history as a whole. The Persians are no longer a threat to Hellenic Greece. Never again will this ancient era civilization attempt to invade this newer classical era civilization. The Greeks also control the Aegean Sea. You already know that if you control the Aegean Sea, you control the entire area. Greeks further form the Delian League, which is a defense pact or an agreement against future Persian aggression. But is it really needed? And finally, Athenian independence is preserved, which allows for government and cultural innovation to continue. In other words, the city is trashed, but the civilization is intact. Go to the next slide. Greek civilization is the last man standing. 
but it's in shambles. So Pericles rebuilds Athens. Pericles was a military hero and leading statesman who dominated Athenian life from 460 BCE to 429 BCE. And Pericles fosters democratic expansion. Now, adult males can vote and are paid for their service. Failure to participate leads to banishment. You are ostracized, you are out of favor, and you are thrown out of Athens. Finally, Pericles writes a funeral oration, or a speech for someone who has died, and it focuses on Athenian democracy and civic duty. Athens and the Parthenon are rebuilt as Greek culture flowered under his rule. In other words, here comes the golden age of Greece. Thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in class.